What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Top Dogs Podcast here on the Field of 68 Media Network. My name is Rob Doster. I got a fun episode on the way for you today. I was able to catch up with ESPN's Jeff Borzello, and we discussed not only the article that he wrote last week about whether or not UConn is a blue blood, uh, but we talked through this year's team, what their future is, and a little bit of why UConn has been so successful on the recruiting trail. I think you're going to enjoy that conversation. I was also able to be joined by Dan Dickow, a uh, former Gonzaga star who now covers the Gonzaga program, does commentary for ESPN and a couple of other outlets uh, to break down Friday night's matchup with number 10 Gonzaga, uh, the third game that UConn is going to be playing against a top 10 opponent this season. So uh, I do think that you will enjoy it. Remember, please rate, review, subscribe to this podcast, do all those things that you know is going to make me happy as a podcaster. If you enjoy what you're hearing here for absolutely free, that is the best way to help support this channel, help support this podcast and help support this platform. You guys know that I appreciate it. So let's get into the episode now, kicking things off ESPN's Jeff Borzello. And now let me welcome on to the Top Dogs podcast here on the Field of 68 Media Network, the man that was called out by name by Dan Hurley in a press conference. Jeff Borzello of ESPN. Can you find that out for me? I So I, I ended up finding out the stat. I didn't want to reach out to him that night because despite the win, he looked very unhappy. <laughs> and so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to I'm gonna let this breathe. I'm going to pretend it was a rhetorical question to me. But I did find out the answer. Yeah, for the – I forget what the question was, but for the people wondering – Something about, it was about uh, free throws in the second half. Like it was the, um, the, the, the game that won the streak. That uh that set the record. Uh, yeah. who is that? It was New Hampshire at yeah, home. Yeah, yeah. They were up by like thirty. Then there were about a hundred calls in the second half. Tom Moore got a technical foul. Dan Hurley got a technical foul at the under four timeout of mm-hmm. a twenty five point game. And he comes in the press conference. And is like I'm steaming, man. He was steaming, yeah, yeah. And then we're uh, seething, seething, seething. That seething, was the word. Seething, yeah. And then proceeds to call you out in the press conference, hoping you can find yeah. out some information for him. So, well, it was the record of most free throws attempted. In the yeah. So I guess New Hampshire took twenty nine free throws in the second half. Uh, that was not the record, um, but it was an incredible amount. It was like way closer to a record. Than it should have been, I guess I would say. <laughs> I just love that he called you out in a press conference by name, which you know makes a lot of sense. You're you're my info guy too. You know, I get all of my fun facts and stats come from uh, mostly uh, about soccer, but yeah, yeah, mostly about soccer. But well, I mean, that's ninety percent of the reason that I talk to you at this point. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Um, all right. So uh, the reason I have you on here is to talk about the article that you wrote last week for ESPN. Um, you basically went through and, and tried to determine if uh, UConn was a blue blood um and before we talk about what you've figured out like why why did you write this now what was the impetus behind it how did you kind of get on this topic where did uh your interest in yukon's blue blood standing come from what was the, give me take me through the thought process behind pitching this one to your editors well i wanted to write something about yukon uh before the season really uh, obviously reigning national champion ranked in the top 10 again and I obviously they kind of need to be written about. And I didn't want to just rehash the because I feel like after the, the night they won the title last year, most people's columns off that game or stories off that game were, well, UConn cemented their blue blood status, blah, 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 quote, quote, quote. And we moved on. So I didn't want to just like rehash that. I kind of wanted to get. Like some sort of tangible evidence that they belong in this conversation. I wanted to find out how they got here kind of get different perspectives. And so that's why, you know, I reached out to Jim Calhoun and I was like, kind of take me through, you know, basically from when you got there until now, just the genesis of the program, talk to Bayheim because he was there before Calhoun got there. So he saw the really bad years. He's been there. You know, he was, he, he watched it after Calhoun left. Like he saw all the Calhoun years. He saw all the titles. Um, and so I kind of was, just wanted to get different perspectives from people. And then I wanted to do, you know, in the article, I kind of went through eight, uh, six categories on kind of how schools have been in the last 25 years, because that's pretty much UConn's argument is the last 25 years. And I want to look at, you know, conference titles, final fours, tournament appearances, um, just different things that people, you know, when, when you're talking about, is this program a blue blood? Is this program a, you know, top five program in the country? Stuff that they base it on. So it, it was all, you know, um performance related uh, i didn't really do much recruiting stuff or nba draft stuff which you know you can argue should be in there too but um 
anyway, the result of at least the the quantitative portion of it was that if you take the four programs that everyone kind of consensus believes are the Blue Bloods, Kansas, Carolina, Duke, and Kentucky, they rank far above everyone in the last 25 years and pretty much all time in all these categories. And that makes sense. But right after them is UConn. Um, you know, they don't rank all that high in, in conference championships, which I'm sure you know and your audience knows. But everything else, I mean, they're there. Um, and, you know, if, if people are saying, you know, UCLA and Indiana, they might not be Blue Bloods anymore, which they're, you know, you can make the argument they're not. You know, someone should take their place. And and I do think there is an argument that says once you're a Blue Blood, you can't not be a Blue Blood. And if you're not a Blue Blood, you can't be a Blue Blood. Um, I, I think that there there are people that would stand by that, and that's fine. But if it's malleable enough where you can move teams out, then I think it should be, I think it could be the case where you move teams in. And over the last 25 years, and I, I think I've made the, the case pretty strongly, I don't think there's really an argument against putting them in. If we're just talking the last 25 years, I mean, if you want to talk the last 100 years, they're not going to be in it. And, you know, Tom Moore admitted it in the piece and Calhoun talks about it in the piece and all these people talk about it in the piece. They are, you know, they, they win championships better than anyone in college basketball right now. And for that, I think they belong in this top five program conversation. Yeah. For me, it's the, this last title is the one that cemented it, right? I yep. think that there are a lot of programs that you can look at that have had kind of one coach or one era. And I would lump Kevin Ollie's title in with like the Calhoun era is kind of the, he won with the remnants of what Jim Calhoun had built. Right. Um, and there's a lot of programs that have been built into something over the course of 10, 15, 20 years yeah. that is as good as any, anything in college basketball. And when you're able to get back to that level again with a new AD and a new Big East, with new leadership, with the new directors, with the new coaching staff, with uh, that's not at all connected to that previous era, to me, that's when you can kind of say, okay, this is this is what they are. Because I don't see the slowing down. Like I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think that they're going to be as long yeah. as Dan Hurley is running this program. I think that they're going to be in this conversation of top ten national title, Big East championships, um, every single year. And the other way that I think about it, Jeff, is that when we were in college, we're basically the same age, right? When we were in college, well, you're older than me, but yeah, that's fine. A couple years older than you. I'm a couple <laughs> years older and graduated right around the same time, so I was <laughs> it took me it took me a little while in college. But um, when we we were in college in the mid 2000s, right, and the time between when we were in college versus when Coach K was turning Duke into like the blue bloodedness that we see Duke is right now was the same amount of time from the kids that are in college right now for when yep. this UConn run started. Like it feels very recent for us because we lived through it, but it's a long, it was 25 years ago, man. That's ancient mm -hmm. history for anybody that is like. Uh, well, that's, Calhoun remember. says that. Yeah, I think yeah. he says it. I mean, I don't know what the exact quote was, but I think he basically said like for Kids nowadays, kids being, you know, 22 year olds, ancient history is 10 years ago. Ancient mm -hmm. history is who won the title last year. And UConn is in the is is that for for a lot of these kids. Um, and and I think he's right. It's just, you know, if you want to extend it to 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, the start of the NCAA tournament, like LaSalle is going to be in this conversation. It's just like it's a completely different era of basketball. Um, and. I don't know. I I I, th I think that it's it's fairly clear that you know when we're talking about the preeminent programs in college basketball, and you mentioned it, like the differentiator for them is that they've done it under you know take Ali out, like that's three still three coaches. If mm -hmm. you want to group them in with the Calhoun era, you can. That's still three different coaches, and like I think Villanova was probably having this sort of same debate or in this same debate after they won their second title, and then it just hasn't really progressed from there. Like had they won a third title, which I think they probably would have done at some point in the, in the Jay Wright era, they would have been in this conversation. But now that we're seeing that the post Jay Wright era is not the same, you know, they're, they're fading from the conversation. They're not really in this discussion anymore. And and so I think that's just kind of what separates UConn from a lot of people. And I think Okafor gave me the stat. I didn't even think about it. They've won one each, a, a title in each of the last four decades. Like that's crazy. Mm -hmm. um there's that's like that is the sign of a of a, a power blue blood whatever you want to call it program yep i agree um so we all know what you know dave benedict and dan hurley and tom moore and jim calhoun and, and i think you spoke with val ackerman too we know yeah. what everyone associated with uconn and the big east is going to say like they are they benefit from uconn having that blue blood status who was the most surprising name that you heard where, where you were like yeah they're a blue blood 
And you well, I thought Bay. I thought Bayheim might push back against it a little bit. Um, like I know he had. You know, you thought Jim Bayheim was, was going to be argumentative? No. Yeah, I thought That's so. I did. I did. And and the phone call started. He was boarding a plane. I guess he had to go do the Carolina Florida State game. And I was like, "Oh, it's a pretty good game." And he was like, "Ah, it's okay." And I was like, "All right, this conversation is going to be great." Um, but no, he was he was like, "I don't." He's like, "There is no debate." He, he, and and I thought he would have at least some sort of you know, you know, the blue bloods are who they are. You know, I don't I don't know if UConn can get in there. They had their lean years and their down years, and um, these other programs really haven't had that. But he was just straight up said he's like 100. percent There's no debate. Um, and I, I think some of that probably stems from, you know, he kind of had a front row seat for what Calhoun did. And I think he, you know, they had their battles on the court and, and UConn and Syracuse had some had some great games. But I think he has a lot of respect for what what Calhoun did to the program. I mean, he 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 even said, I mean, he said they were they were in the Yankee conference when they, they came to the Big East. They were horrible when Calhoun took over. Um, and and I can't remember if it was Calhoun that told me the story or Tom Morris told me the story that the first Big East meeting at Calhoun sitting there and it's just these legends and it's, you know, it's, it's all the guys that you associated with Big East basketball. And then it's UConn, which was just not good. And Calhoun is say what you said though. Say what you said though. It was the guys that had one name. It was one Raleigh, name. Bayheim, yeah, and, I, and, and Big, Big John. John. <laughs> Big John. Uh, PJ is a, also kind of not one name, but it was just, I mean, it's, uh, it's just kind of remarkable how far they came and, and really how quickly they did it. Um, you know, it wasn't a three decade rebuild or a two decade rebuild. I mean, he had them rolling pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, I, I said, I was said, you know, did you ever see this coming? I mean, not, not just five championships. Nobody sees that coming. He was like, I just want to get out of the eight, nine game in the <laughs> Big East tournament. Like that's, he said, you know, he said national championships were not our goal. It was, we want to just be competitive in the Big East. And w- if we're competitive in the Big East, we can be competitive nationally. Yeah, I've always said the two greatest building jobs in college basketball history are Jim Calhoun and what he did in Stores, Connecticut, mm-hmm. and uh, and Scott Drew turning yep. Baylor into a powerhouse in Waco. I don't think that there's um, anything that compete with that. All right, I want to ask you real quick about this year's teams. Um, UConn's played three games at the Garden, and I haven't seen you at one of them yet. We uh, that's we not kind true. of I was at the up. Texas game. I wasn't there. That okay, was the well, one that's I why didn't you didn't see to. me. Yeah, I, I was the under the game. weather for the Carolina game. You would not have wanted me there. <laughs> you definitely would not have wanted. Me. I was not going to go to the Indiana game because I, I was going to see them the next day. Um, yeah, I, I wish I went to the Carolina game, but yes, you, you, I only went to one of the three games in in my area, which yeah, is you pretty were, sad. You are DNP flu like symptoms, right? Yes, yes, yeah, that's a good <laughs> way to put it. Um, all right, so what what needs to happen with this group? over the course of the next four months for them to be able to win a national championship and be the first team since uh, 2006, 2007 to repeat. Uh, stay healthy. Um, I really don't, I don't know if they're missing something. I think from it's get a, healthy, right? What? Yeah. Get, get healthy. healthy, get healthy and stay healthy. Like I, I, I don't know if they're from a personnel standpoint, I don't think they're really missing anything. Um, you know, their shooting can kind of come and go, but I think that they have shooters. They have guys that can make shots. I mean, Spencer's a great shooter. Caravan's a great shooter. We saw Ball hit shots. And Tristan Newton hit shots. I mean, they have enough shooters for guys that can make shots. They have defense. They have size. They have depth. Um, I think they have a good mix of experience. They have NBA level talent, lottery level talent. But I think they all just need to get 100 percent and then stay that way. And if that's the if that happens, then you know I think you can put them. I mean, so far even with them. Even with Castle being out for a bunch of games, Clinging coming back slowly, Spencer playing on you know one ankle for a couple of games, I think them and Arizona have been the two best teams in the country, or the two most impressive at least. And so I, I think that when you're saying okay, what 100% UConn, they probably go to Lawrence and they probably win at Kansas. And I think Kansas is probably a top five team in the country, number two right now. And so I, I just it's hard for me to say there are teams that are a level above UConn. I think Arizona is probably has established himself as the best team in the country right now, but I think UConn is leading that next group, and I think they've been the most impressive outside them. You know, I, I think that you can say that we need to see Klingon maybe do it more consistently against good teams, really good opponents, but I think that's going to come with again health and more time. Um, but I don't, I don't really see any weaknesses on this team. Really, it's hard for. 
Klinger right now because he's he had the foot thing in the preseason, yep. so he didn't have a chance to get into shape before the season mm-hmm. started. Then he got the I think it's the he's got like a toe thing on the other foot now, so mm-hmm. he's not really practicing, and it's hard to get in shape when you're a big man if you can't really move. But right. when you have like a foot thing and a toe thing. You can't go out there and just run sprints and get healthy because you got to rest your feet when you're not playing. Like it's just, it's kind of like this vicious circle where it's been very hard for him to feel like he's gotten going so far this year. You still see the and impact, that, and, that's, and that's really nitpicking. If if, if yeah. I'm saying that's their biggest, you know, personnel question or biggest thing they need to improve, like that's very much nitpicking because he's been, you know, just in general, he's been very good. I mean, the New Hampshire game we talked about. I think he had what 29, 30 in that game. Um, I, I just, I really don't see any real noticeable deficiencies that are going to end up, you know, you can kind of circle, you know, Kansas's lack of shot creation or, um, you know, I'm trying to think of another title contender, uh, you know, Purdue's maybe lack of foot speed. Like there's just not a ton of, there's not a noticeable Achilles heel that I'm going to say, oh, okay, this could cost UConn in March. Um, I just really think they need to get to a hundred percent and then stay that way. The, here's the one thing I would say, I think they have three perimeter defenders that are um, below average on ball defenders. I don't think, I think they have one guy that's really good at the point of attack in their starting lineup. And I think that Asan DR, when you bring him in is really good at ball hawking, but I wouldn't call Tristan Newton, Cam Spencer, or Alex Caravan, great defenders. And to me, that's kind of, that's the issue is that they are not going to be the level that they were defensively last year, but it also might not matter if Klingon's healthy. You got the great wall of Bristol back there and you just funnel people to him, run them off the three point line and just say, yeah, go ahead. Try to finish over that dude. I also don't think Caravan's going to be guarding a ton of fours that are like going to just be blown by him off the bounce. I mean, he'll, there'll be some, I, did, I don't know if he's going to get lit up consistently by, I mean, if he plays again, you know, I guess Carolina kind of had like Harrison Ingram and guys like that, but there's just not a ton of dudes. Harrison Ingram, KJ Adams, Dylan Mitchell, Malik. KJ Adams Malik. is a different. <laughs> That'd be great. Dylan Mitchell, I forgot about him. He was he had his career game against. Like, maybe yeah. I take that back. You're yeah. probably you're right. Maybe there are maybe there are four is going to light him up. I do think Castle it will help once he's there. Um, yes. Just more size on the perimeter. Another guy that can create shots. Um, yeah, so I guess offensively, I would say there are no Achilles heel. Defensively, you're probably right. Uh, now yeah. that you kind and of at go the same time. Line, yeah, at the same time, they are currently seventh on Ken Palm in defensive two point field goal percentage. They are top 15 in offensive and defensive rebounding percentage. Uh, they are top 15 in block percentage, and they are a top 20 defense in college basketball. So, like, well, I think kinda, some of it is, I, I think they make up a little for the lack of foot speed on the perimeter and size. Yep. I mean, Newton's 6'5, Spencer 6'4, Caravan 6'8, Castle 6'6, Ball, I mean, is long. He's 6'3, but he's long. Like, they don't have, you know, like Braden Smith is, is not all that quick footed. He's also small. Um, so I think UConn is just their sheer size is going to be enough against certain opponents. Where do you stand on the Tristan Newton All American bandwagon? I'm a, I'm on it. I'm on it. Um, I I keep assu- like I keep expecting big. Like, all right, maybe you know it was a hot three weeks and he's going to slow down, and then like he'll hit big shots against Carolina and he'll go off at Kansas, and it's just you know at some point I do think he might you know the the it nothing seems unsustainable. I mean, it's not like, aside from the Kansas game where he hit six threes. Like, it's not like he's shooting sixty four percent from three, and it's you know going to regress to the mean. Like, he's just he's just playing really well, and he's kind of playing within the offense too, which is which is even more impressive. He's the weirdest dude to watch because he looks so uncomfortable all the time with the ball in his hands, and he looks so awkward, and he's kind of herky jerky, and like it looks like he's about to dribble it off his foot. It's unorthodox, are, yeah. Yeah, and people are all over him, and then all of a sudden, like, he managed to get like an inch of space, and he's got like this weird release, and he hits a tough contested three from 28 feet, and you're like, what the fuck was that? Where did yeah, that he does, it, and he, it just seems like he kind of plays in the same, I don't know, the same general attitude the entire time. Like, I mean, national championship game or a game against like Pine Bluff, it seems like he kind of has the same, like approaches the same way, which... Yeah, you know, I guess is is good. Um, it took a while but, for the staff to kind of yeah buy into that, right? Like the, he's got this very kind of I don't know I don't want to call it like laissez faire, but he's a laid back dude. He's just he's this dude from El Paso, Texas that is wired very differently than a Dan Hurley, a Kimani Young, and a Luke Murray is. And I think it took some time for them to kind of realize that like he takes it seriously, even though he kind of plays a style that makes it seem like he's. Uh, too cool for school is like the wrong way to frame, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it, yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you could also kind of trace that a little bit to when they had that losing streak last year, right around the new year or January, or whatever. Like, he was like objectively not good 
during yeah, that losing bad. streak. Um, and I, so I guess you can kind of say if you're looking at it from from that perspective, saying, "All right, well, what's what's wrong with us during the streak?" You could say, "Well, Newton's not playing that well. Like he's playing very poorly." And so I guess you could say, "All right, well, that's maybe one area we can improve." And then of course, like down the stretch, he's he's really good. He was you know one of the best players, or maybe the best player on the floor at least in the first half of that title game. Um, and and now he's a premier point guard in the country. Yeah. All right. Last one I got for you. You were you came up as a recruiting guy. You still love the the recruiting world. Um, the one thing I've said about the UConn staff is that they are they hit the highest batting average I think of anybody in college basketball. If you look at who they're bringing in and how often those guys end up being very good players for them and kind of fitting the role, I think I I did the math like over the last four years, you, like probably seventy two per. 60 it was like seven out of ten of the guys that they brought in were going to um live up to expectations and live up to hype is that common around the country is that uncommon am i just do i just have my yukon blinders on here no I, I think it's i think it's right and i think it's a it's i think it's a few things i think one they have, they have patience um with the play i mean like you know samson johnson they could have they could have probably he could have entered the portal two years ago and you know nobody would have batted an eye and now he's a a very useful piece off the bench. Um, you know, Caravan was a really good pickup for them. He was not, I thought he was really good in high school. Not a lot, you know, he was a top hundred kid. I mean, but he was not a can't miss player. And the other the other part of it, and, and this kind of relates to Caravan, is that they they are willing to adjust the the system or the role to fit their guys. Mm. You know, they're not putting Caravan in the same peg that they would put a Samson Johnson, or they're not putting solo ball, solo ball in the same thing, that same exact role. They're going to play Steph Castle. In. Um, I, I just, I don't know. It, it's, it's a, I think it's unique in that they are, they're patient, they're flexible and they just, they evaluate well um, a little bit of, you know, they have had good fortune. I mean, if they had gotten Nick Timberlake in the spring, they don't get Cam Spencer. So that's, that's a, a, a fortunate thing to happen, but, you know, you're going to, you're going to get those bounces sometimes when, um, you know, you're a good recruiting staff, but I think a lot of it is really just patience and, and, and just willing to be flexible and willing to adjust your, your, your system, your roles, your ideas to your personnel, as opposed to this is how we're going to play. This guy has to do this. This guy has to do this. And you can just be flexible that way. I mean, Klingon's a different big man than Sonogo was, and they've adjusted that way. Um, I don't know. I, it's, it's, you're right though. It is not, it's not common for big programs who are going after top 50, top hundred kids, especially now when, when kids are leaving after transferring after a year, freshmen have a, you know, a really hard time contributing right away that they have this high of a hit rate uh, before guys leave stores. I'm just picturing the alternate reality where Nick Timberlake is on UConn and Cam Spencer is on Kansas and Kansas goes undefeated. Kansas averages <laughs> 88 a game, never loses. And yes, it's, yeah, it's funny because Spencer, man, Spencer on Kansas would be exactly what they need. Yeah, he's exactly what they're missing, and he's exactly what you kind of needed as well. Listen, Borzello, it's always great to catch up, man. Maybe one day we'll actually end up at the same game together at the Garden. Maybe. We'll see. Eventually. You're not going to Indy this weekend, are you? I am not. Goodman will be out there, though, so sorry about that. Yeah, that's a tough one. Thanks, (laughs) huh? All right, man. As you guys know by now, we've partnered with BetMGM Sportsbook for this college basketball season. We're going to be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks and predictions throughout the college basketball season, and we are going to have special offers for you, the listeners and the viewers on the field of 68, each and every week during the season. If you haven't signed up with BetMGM yet, use the bonus code FIELD. $1,500 $1,500 and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager on BetMGM Sportsbook. Here's what you got to do. Download the BetMGM app. Sign up using the bonus code FIELD1500. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. You will receive up to $1,500 in bonus bets if that bet loses. Just make sure you use the bonus code FIELD1500 when you sign up. And remember, BetMGM is now available under one wallet in select states. As a New Jersey resident, this is super convenient for me when I have to go cover games in New York or Philly. When cross the state borders, just log into your existing account instead of having to create new accounts in each state that you go to. And most importantly, I got to let you know, we do have some fun stuff coming up for this college basketball season. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odds boosts, my personal favorite, parlay odds boosts. So download the BetMGM app today. 
And now let me welcome on to the show Dan Dickow, who is the host of Gonzaga Nation, part of the Sports Illustrated Podcast Network. Uh, we're going to have a little uh, cross-branding here, Dan. We, uh, we're we're going to talk about this UConn-Gonzaga game that is being played on Friday night, 10 o'clock in Seattle. It is in... So it's in the NBA arena out there. I can't remember the name of the arena, right? I'm at Pledge. I've yet to be there, but uh, once the Seattle got the uh, NHL expansion cracking, they redid the arena. I've heard it's one of the nicest in the country now. So I want you on here because I think you know the Gonzaga basketball program better than anyone, uh, specifically how to pronounce Gonzaga. It's not Gonzaga, <laughs> right? It's Gonzaga. Am yeah, I getting it right? Gonzaga. I'm close by. They're, they're, you know, they're, one of the interesting kind of a ways to describe it was you don't zog, you zag. So zigzag, Gonzaga. Um, so that's that's been one that's always been frustrating for some people. Like, why can't East Coast people pronounce it right? I, I think it's funny still to this day. Like, Gonzaga has been so good for so long. Do you just not pay attention or do you just kind of, you know, have your own little kind of cadence with how you speak and just it is what it is. But there's there's words that I don't pronounce correctly, too. So I guess, you know, we'll call it a wash. It's hard, man. It's hard because it's just so ingrained that it's Gonzaga. And, then you know, that's just kind of the way I see coasters speak, man. Um, all right. So we had the uh, the Dan Dickow Super Bowl last week. Uh, it was it did not go great for your Zags, but um, what have you made from this this team, this program, the start to the season? Uh, you know, obviously the, the a little bit of bad injury luck uh, before the year got going, but where where do you see this group right now? Well, it was a disappointing loss for sure against UW. Uh, I think the Huskies of UW brought a lot of energy throughout the game, and that's to be expected. It was a big home game for them. Uh, I think when you look at Gonzaga's roster with their newcomers, their young guys in particular, they haven't played in a road environment like that yet. All the big games they've played so far have been neutral site games. So it was a probably a shock to the system uh, about you know the energy in, in the kind of focus on beating Gonzaga because it is a quote unquote rivalry game. But, you know, big picture wise, I thought they played well for about 30 minutes ish. Uh, I don't think they ever played great in any stretches to where they could extend the lead. I think they were up 10 or 11 at some point, but you, you know, when you play college basketball against an experienced team these days, 10 or 11 points isn't much. And so when you don't distance yourself uh, more than that against UW, who's got some good players in Keon Brooks, uh, Savir Wheeler has been a, a nice addition. Paul Mulcahy uh, from Rutgers has been a nice addition as well. When you're playing against a team with experience that just kind of keeps going and going and isn't going to back down and give in, uh, you're going to have some issues down the stretch when you don't execute the way that Gonzaga wanted to down the stretch. I mean, I think they missed 11 of their last 12 shots. They had a couple guys that had some looks that they probably could have taken. They were hesitant to take, and take them. So then the shot became either – they passed the shot up or they were rushed or or hurried or contested. So they, they didn't execute great down the stretch. But again, this is a, still a new team. Uh, the thing that concerns me at, at times is the depth in the backcourt. Um, they're going to have to figure out a way to get Nemhart and Hickman off the floor for a couple minute stretches here or there so that they can be fresh down the stretch. Because I think that might have had something to do with um, you know, not playing great the last 10 minutes of the game or so. Now, these are 19, 20, 22 year old guys. They should be able to play 40 minutes, but you don't necessarily want them to because I think down the stretch of the season, you're also going to need June Yo as well as uh, Luka Krajnovic to, to give you something as far as, you know, a 10 to 12 minute stretch during games where you can count on and rely on them. And I don't think that, that either one of them has kind of jumped forward and taken that, you know, opportunity yet. Yeah. That was going to be my question to you is that my, I think that the pieces are there, right? Like when I look at a Mark yeah. few program, I think what you want is a really good experienced point guard, a really good experienced five man that kind of knows how to duck in and seal and, and score with his back to the basket. And you want shooters and, and playmakers around them. And I think if you look at their starting five, you have like the, the roster uh, construction makes sense. Without Steel Venters there, I just, when you bring somebody off the bench, you're kind of forced into a situation where you got to move Anton down to the three, right? You don't really have someone at this point that I think is uh, comfortable coming in and, and playing on the perimeter. And I just, I don't know where that comes from. It just feels like that 
that piece is not quite there on this roster. Am I reading that right? And where do you think you get that backcourt depth coming from? No, you're right. I mean, the the loss of Venters is bigger than a lot of people really realize. I mean, look, he was the Big Sky Player of the Year a season ago. He's six seven. He's long. He's got a high release. He's a guy that you know when you watch him play at Eastern year over year because he started as a walk on redshirt. I don't know if you knew that. So he started as a walk on redshirt, earned his way to a scholarship, became a starter. Then he's the Big Sky Player of the Year. So he's a guy that continuously progressed in his career and, and I saw him uh, a little bit over the summer and I saw another progression in his game where I think he would have really helped expand Gonzaga's offense you know because they don't have a true knockdown shooter this year like a Kispert like what Venters would have been um, you, you can kind of pack the pain in at times and dig or double down on on the big threats with EK and and, and Braden Huff a little bit now when when he's getting going on the interior because Venters, you could step six, seven feet behind the line. You got to respect mm-hmm. it. Um, defensively, he wasn't great, and I, but I don't think that that was ever going to be, you know, his calling card. He was shoot three, stretch the floor, create driving angles for for Nemhart and Hickman, uh, and then create space for interior post play with the guys that I mentioned. So that was a big loss. Um, but you kind of touched on it. Roster construction with Coach Few. He's he's a master at putting parts together, putting pieces together. There's been games where Watson's been at the three. Um, he doesn't shoot it as well as you would want for a three, but he does so many other little things. And Coach Few makes all these little adjustments that uh, I think you can do that in stretches and, and not worry too much about shooting. But the, the three-point shooting has been a bit of a concern for Gonzaga this year. I think they've only got one game this season where they've hit double digits from the three-point line. Yeah, and it, it does help that, Raiden Huff and Ben Gray can both kind of shoot it a little bit, right? So it doesn't quite get as crowded in the pain and it creates a little room for uh for Graham EK to be able to obviously. he's so much fun, by the way. Like I there's something about lefty post guys that is just fun to watch. Like he he's a lot of fun. I've enjoyed seeing him. Yeah. Kind of no, he's been terrific because I mean everybody knew about Nemhart just because he had a big game in the NCAA tournament. Andrew obviously was at Gonzaga first. Um, and so you kind of had a good idea of what you were gonna get there. But EK was kind of the unknown unless you really watched a lot of college basketball. I mean, you're a college hoops junkie, so you know how good EK was. He was like the un- he was like the forgotten guy in the transfer portal because he didn't play. But two years ago, he was 19 and a half and nine and a half at Wyoming in a good Mountain West league. Mm-hmm. His numbers aren't going to be that this year at Gonzaga, but he is very good and he's providing kind of exactly what Gonzaga was hoping for, I think. So I think that there are two matchups here that uh, are going to be what determines who wins this game on Friday night. The first one is the point guard matchup. Tristan Newton against Ryan Newton. Uh, Tristan's like a bigger guard. He can kind of overwhelm players that are a little bit smaller than him. Nemhard's at, I think he's listed at six foot. I think that might be a little bit generous. Um, So how Ryan is able to deal with the size and physicality of Tristan Newton, who's playing like all, he's averaging 17, seven and six right now. He's playing like an all American. To me, that's one of them. The other one is the four spot. The way that you can kind of attack UConn's defense and what you've seen teams over and over do is go right at Alex Caravan at the four spot. And Anton Watson, um, I think he is underrated nationally in terms of how good he is. I don't think people appreciate like the the progression that he's made year over year. I don't think people realize that like part of the reason he wasn't a big score the last two years is there was a guy on that team by the name of Drew Timmy, who uh, some people might have heard of. He was uh, he was OK at this whole basketball game. Um, so to me, it's how does UConn slow down Anton Watson at the four and how does Gonzaga? You see, I got it there. Gonzaga uh, slow down Tristan Newton at the point. Well, I think those are two great questions and and you beat me to it. I was kind of going to ask you, how do you think they should should attack Caravan? Um, but I, I think one of the ways Gonzaga is unique and they can attack a four at, at times is because Anton has the freedom to rebound and push in transition. Gonzaga play, wants to play as fast as anybody in the country. And one of the ways they can do that is when you have a four who gets a rebound, he just pushes it in transition himself. Ben Gregg can do that at times as well. Braden Huff actually has the freedom to do that at times as well. So pretty much anybody except EK can get it and go off the glass, which really kind of speeds your offense up, whether you're looking for initial throw aheads or you're just looking to get into secondary offense, it speeds everything up. So I I think that's a good point. I do think and agree with you that Anton is undervalued nationally. I think a lot of it's just because he's not a scorer. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you just look at box scores, 
other than the UCLA game where he went off for 32 points and he was 14 to 15 from the field. Was unbelievable in that game. Yes. Unbelievable. I mean, he looked like Gonzaga prep high school Anton Watson days. That's how good he looked. Um, but, you know, uh, if you're just looking at box scores, he doesn't jump out at you. But if you watch the game, which I know you watch way too much college basketball, it's like True. plugging holes defensively. It's deflections. It's spacing. It's cutting at the right time. He, he does so many of those little things that don't show up. And then in regards to the point guard matchup, you know, uh, the, the clips in the stretches I've watched of UConn this year, you're exactly right. Newton looks like he's made that next level jump that you saw glimpses and flashes a season ago, but with the roster construction that, that UConn had, you know, you had to get Jordan Hawkins, the ball you had to, I think it was uh, Jackson, right? Yep. He was going to have the ball in his hands a, a fair amount, but, but you saw that, Hey, this kid's pretty dang good when it's his team to really run it and kind of have more freedom. Uh, he's going to be a monster. And I think that's what you're seeing. So with being a bigger guard, that does pose some problems for Nemhart, um, you know, because he's still balancing that push and transition, look for myself, look for others. Oh, we don't have anything. Let's get it back out top and let's let's get into our offensive flow, whatever we want to get into, whether it's high-low looks, whether it's pick and rolls. So he can get sped up at times, and I think that's something that, that the staff has been working with him on. Uh, but, you know, for someone who is always an attack go 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 mentality, like I think Nemhart is, it can be a work in progress. Uh, and there's been games he's been really good at it, and then there's been a couple games where it's like, um, you know, you 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 see somebody who just kind of go go. Oh no, I got to pull it back a little. Go go. No, I got to pull it back a little bit. So he's still figuring that out. But Coach Few does such a good job of of teaching point guards what he wants and how he wants it done. All right, last thing I got for you is. I don't think that there's as much star power on this Gonzaga team but we, as we've seen in recent years, but it feels like they are kind of figuring it out and and at that same level, right? Like, I don't know if they're as good as the, uh, the 2021 team or the 2017 team or some of those teams like in the late 2010s that were, you know, ranked number one. I, I'm not sure they're quite there, but this is still a second weekend team that has a chance to make a run. Do you... Do you agree with that? What have you like kind of big picture about where this program is right now? No, I do agree with it. I, I I don't think they have the NBA level talent that some of the Gonzaga teams have had in the past. But again, that's there's nothing wrong with that if you want to be a good college basketball team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you you look at Purdue. Is Zach Eady an NBA talent? Probably not. You know, uh, Drew Timmy, as good as he was at the college level, you're seeing him scrap and claw and try to find ways to, to impact the game in the G League so he can get that shot at the NBA. So college talent doesn't always match up to pro talent. So it's a matter of how you kind of combine the talent that you currently have on your roster to be successful. And Coach View has done it a number of different ways. He's had success with the just co great college players. He's had success with uh, guys that have pro potential. And I think when you look at this year's team, it's it's a group of college players that are very good that if they continue to come together collectively, they will be a second level or second weekend team. Now, with the way college basketball is this year, I, we said it last year. I think you and I and, and Goodman were on at a point. Last year, was there was a lot of parity. I mm -hmm. think that's the exact same thing this year. I think there's a ton of parity. Um, you know, Purdue has looked really good at times, and then they lose. Uh, Kansas has looked really good at times, and then they lose. So I, I think there's opportunities. I think it's going to be very similar to, to last year with, you know, UConn was great early. They went through some stretches middle of the year where they were so-so, but then they got right, and they were they were clearly the best team in the NCAA tournament. I, I think we might see something similar from a team this year uh, of a team getting hot at the right time, and maybe that uh, pairing and seeding in the tournament opens up just perfectly for them. Uh, and that team makes a big run. So uh, I think this team, uh, you know, is still learning their their way. I do think uh, that with them sitting at eight and two right now, and I don't say this lightly, they could be 10 and 0 because mm -hmm. that you, or that Purdue game, they had a stretch in the second half where they missed 16 threes in a row. And they had a couple turnovers where it led to run outs. You clean up, you you hit two of those threes, you clean up one of those turnovers, and all of a sudden it's a one possession game in the final minute, as opposed to I think where they lost by nine, I want to say. So they were right there in the UW game, you know, no different. They lost by five, but they missed 11 of their last 12 shots. 
um, you know, they could easily be sitting at 10 and 0. And instead of being ranked 10th in the AP, you could be top three, maybe four. Um, but I, I, it's one of those things where you're just splitting hairs at this point in the season. So um, that's kind of what I see. Question for you on the UConn side. With with all the turnover in college basketball, you know, I think Danny Hurley did as quiet a, and good a job as anybody of keeping the guys that had potential to be impactful next year on their roster. Would you agree with that? Yeah, the, there were a couple guys that were um, considering transferring or considering looking at uh, the NBA level. Like Tristan Newton took a long uh, look at whether or not he should um, head to the professional ranks. He's a fifth year senior. He just won a national championship. He was the best player in the national title game. Like there's an argument to be made that what else are you going to do in college, right? Like that might be as good of a time as any to go start your professional life. And I totally get that. Right. Um, so he ended up coming back. Donovan Klingon ended up coming back when he had a chance to be a first round pick. Um, and then a guy like, you know, Samson Johnson off the bench, he's back for another year when he very easily could have entered the portal. You're a junior and you're playing behind Donovan Klingon. Like, you're not going to get a ton of minutes doing that. So um, keeping some of those role players to come back and be able to do a job on your roster, I think is, I mean, look, you lose three guys that are pros, that were all league players, that were borderline all Americans and Jordan Hawkins, Andre Jackson, and Adama Sanogo, and being able to stay as good as you are, you got to have some level of continuity. You can't just completely reload and do that. Um, and I think what they've, they've gotten really good at uh, is figuring out, guys that they can bring in that will fit within the culture and fit within the way that they want to play and then figuring out how to be able to utilize them. And specifically it's Cam Spencer to me, right? He was a really good player at Rutgers. He was not a guy that was averaging 15 points, four boards and four assists while shooting 44% from three, which is what he's doing right now. Like he is, he's all big East level. And I don't know if anybody thought that he was going to be that coming in. And um, he really has been, the difference between UConn being just good and UConn being, you know, like people are actually talking about them having a chance to repeat. Like it, it's been, it's not just the retention. It's being able to get guys to come in and have that level of immediate impact. Right. And I, that's just, I mean, Dan, you've been around basketball long enough. That's not easy to do. It's not yeah. easy to do to identify um, the personalities that fit. So let me ask you this then. For for Gonzaga to 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 win against UConn in Seattle, granted that's a cross country venture, so that's tough travel for for college kids because they're not used to that six hours. You got probably a quick shoot around the night before, shoot around morning of, um, and it plays on college guys more than it does pros like the travel, the travel, and it also plays on coaches' minds too, which is unfortunately why you don't see as many of these you know East versus West matchups uh, as I'm sure we all would like to see, um, but. How does Gonzaga need to attack UConn to come out with a victory? I think there's two things. One is being able to to get easy baskets in transition, right? Being able to – that's what they do better than anyone. It's its get a rebound, run, get an easy layup, or be able to get something quick where you get like a quick ball screen or a quick duck in for Graham E.K. or you get, uh, you know, Ryan Nemhard get into his right hand and hit one of those like little 12-foot pull-ups that he loves. Um, I think being able to beat UConn's defense down the floor because you don't have to deal with the great wall of Bristol at the five spot. Like he takes Donovan Klingon is so good at taking away anything within like eight feet of the bucket. It yeah. uh, it, it makes it very difficult to score down there. Um, I think that's one of them. And the other thing is you have to be able to attack some of their their weak spots defensively. Like if there is a knock on this UConn team, it is at the point guard spot and at the four spot, they are not they don't have the level of athleticism that you would expect. Like Eric, Alex Garabin does a lot of things really, really well. He's a really good shooter. He's a really good scorer. He can put the ball on the floor better than people realize. He he makes the right pass when the ball is moving around the perimeter. It doesn't stick, um, but he's not a guy that you're going to look at him and say, okay, he can stop the best form in a college basketball and shut them down. We've seen other teams be able to kind of take advantage of that. Um, Tristan Newton, as good as he is offensively, He's not someone that is going to be at his best trying to stay in front of smaller, quicker point guards. It's just not what he does great, right? And I think that Ryan Nemhart is a guy that can, might be able to take a little bit of advantage of that. So it's being able to win those two matchups to me and being able to get easy buckets in transition so you don't have to worry about, you know, what are we going to do with this seven foot three monster at the five spot? Gotcha. And that's one of the things Gonzaga has always done so well of take advantage of, uh, 
the pace with which they play at because everybody says they want to play fast in the college world, you know, when they're recruiting players because high school players say, oh, I want to play fast. I want to get up and down. But they don't realize the level of dedication to conditioning and, and skill work and then, uh, you know, staying with that plan it takes to really be good at it. Um, but Gonzaga's done that and they've taken advantage of of many teams because they play fast and they get guys out of their comfort zone. And if they can get Klingon out of his comfort zone and, and getting him up and down the floor quickly and not allowing him to get set defensively uh, in the middle where they're putting him in transition runs and they're putting him in quick ball screens, that, that could be key because uh, I think that's some, another way that, you know, Gonzaga has tried to attack Zach Eady when they played them the last two years. Um, and I'm sure UConn's seen that prepared for it. And they, they've seen that from a number of teams as well. Yeah, and the the big thing with Klingon is he had a he had a foot issue in the preseason where he was he was out for a month during practices, right? Didn't miss any game time, but it's hard to get in shape when all you do is you sit there and you ride the bike. And now on the other foot, he's dealing with I think it's like a turf toe injury. They haven't been very um specific about it, but uh he he hasn't been able to look when you have problems with your feet and you're seven foot three, you don't want to push that too much. So um, he hasn't quite been able to get into the level of shape that you would want him to be in. And it just, it's, it's a fact of when you're dealing with injuries, that's just what happens. So, uh, combine all that with the fact that it's going to be a 10 o'clock Eastern time tip. I'm going to be tired when that thing's tipping off. I don't know if these college kids are going to be feeling it, but I'm definitely going to be feeling it, Dan. Awesome. Well, I, I, unfortunately, I won't be at the game. I'm going to be at my high school son's game that night, but I'll be, uh, I'll probably be staying up late my time Pacific coach watching the the reruns on DVR. Yeah. All right. So I won't spoil the game for you, but, but as soon as it's done, I promise you on Saturday morning, whatever happens, you'll be hearing from me. Hopefully it'll be to talk a little bit of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Vice versa. <laughs> there you go. So awesome. Always good catching up with you, Dan. And hopefully this is uh this is a series that will go on for a long time because I just I think there's a lot of history between these two programs and it's always fun to play somebody that is not, you know, I, I you love these in conference rivalries. It's just fun to play these other uh blue blood powerhouse top 10 programs in college basketball and turn that into a thing. So appreciate you having on. Uh, appreciate you coming on my pod, and I appreciate you having me on Gonzaga Nation. Yeah, it was like a dual dual episode, dual show for us today. So we'll definitely have to do it again. Who knows? Maybe there's another rematch, UConn, Gonzaga, and NCAA tournament. Uh, they've provided some good games over the years, that's for sure. They certainly have. Dan, it's been a pleasure, man. 